Good evening. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll get started now. I appreciate you coming out tonight and bearing with us with our technical difficulties, but uh, my name is Richard McCarthy, the town planner for the town of Norfolk. Um, I have tonight with me Joss Fiala from MAPC, who's going to be doing the presentation. And based on what we're dealing with, technical difficulties, we'll probably, you'll speak up, hopefully, and then ask questions when we get the questions. And then Josh will probably repeat them just to make sure the question is, is heard, to be able to get answers to it. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Josh. We'll go through the presentation. And then we'll probably, you can ask questions as we go along. It's not, you know, if it's a burning question or if you could hold it, just remember that we equally as appreciated. So, Josh. Thank you, Rich. Good evening, everyone. Let me get set up here for a second. Hello, so I'll try to project. So this microphone that I'm wearing is actually for the video, but not for you here. So if you have trouble hearing me, maybe just give me a, like, need to be louder sort of thing if I dip down any time during the presentation. So my name is Josh Fiala. I'm an architect and urban planner, a principal planner at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Uh, our agency is the regional planning agency for the Norfolk area communities uh, centered in Boston. So we're the, the Boston area regional planning agency. Um, so uh, we've been working with the town of Norfolk, and I'm very pleased to be with you here this evening to talk about uh, town center and town center zoning that we've been uh, working diligently with the town over for the last uh, half a year or more uh, and have recommendations here to bring forward this evening to walk you through them uh, and to uh, provide you uh, with opportunities to ask questions and get information. The focus of this meeting is in preparation for a special town meeting, uh, November 19th of this year, uh, coming up in a, a few months. Uh, and really the focus is to explain our recommendations uh, with a focus on the zoning, which is required to be approved at town meeting. There are other aspects of our study beyond the zoning, and I'll touch on those as well. But the focus of the presentation this evening is really on those aspects of our recommendations that would, have, that would require town meeting approval. So with that, we get into the agenda for this evening. So I'll give a little bit of study background, uh, what we've been doing, why we're doing this, uh, talk about the recommendations, which is really the heart of our presentation this evening, uh, we'll have time for discussion. As Rich mentioned, you can ask questions as I'm going through, but try to hold the bulk of the questions towards that discussion period. And we'll talk about some of the next steps. Uh, this is one in a series of meetings which will be leading up to that special town meeting in November. Um, just a show of hands, how many were at the community meeting which we held in April as a part of this process? Good, so I'll, I'll uh, adjust our recommend, or our, uh, summary of the study background because many of you have heard much of it in April then, but our studies focused on the town center. Specifically these areas you see here in the uh, two tones of brown labeled B1 and B1 out, so that's the business district of the zoning. Uh, and there's two sub-districts as you can see with the B1 and B1 out, and those uh, include the areas around Main Street, uh, Rockwood Road, Meeting House Road, uh, Liberty Lane, uh, and other streets in the town center. Years ago, uh, Norfolk citizens such as yourselves uh, came together during the town master plan process and articulated a vision, a community-based vision for town center. You can see that on the screen. Um, and this is really what many uh, studies, planning efforts such as this one have been trying to uh, materialize uh, in investments in the town center to be consistent with this vision which was expressed and still uh, valid and viable today. So it focuses on town center as a pedestrian oriented place that's walkable, has a mix of uses, uh, retail, commercial services, including housing, and is a social and cultural hub uh, for the town.
So in addition to the um, town center vision, which was articulated, uh, there have been additional studies since that 2007 master plan. Uh, there was a Norfolk Open Space and Recreation Plan in 2017, Housing Production Plan in 2017, a town-wide economic development plan in 2018. All of these plans have uh, been studies pushing forward uh, in terms of the implementation recommendations uh, which will bring Town Center closer to that vision. This study, uh, we believe, uh, is an implementation effort from those previous studies. So we're actually, our recommendations for you this evening are uh, less in the atmosphere of planning and more in the atmosphere of implementation. These are uh, recommendations for zoning which will result in changes which hopefully will uh, allow uh, more development investment in the Town Center as you're moving forward. The town center already has many assets, uh, and this set of recommendations builds upon the great strengths of the town center, those assets which all already exist today, uh, and the tremendous progress which has already been made. You can see a list of those items on the screen, which have also been implementation efforts the town has undertaken to move the town center towards that vision. So, Mixed-use development is a tricky thing uh, in town center investment. Uh, and there are many things which have to go right to result in high-quality town center development. Uh, we are not in control of all those things. Uh, we're in control of a small set of those things. The town is, uh, the, us as advisors to the town. Uh, there are not uh, a full list of things which we can do control. You can see this bolded list is many of the things which have to go right to create an atmosphere for investment in the town center for mixed use development. Um, and we're focused on the regulations and incentives that encourage and allow that investment to occur. So that, that's a concrete item along with some of those previous bullets that I showed of town activity that you do control. Uh, and some of, the, some of the aspects of that zoning and regulations uh, we've uh, identified issues with, and we'll highlight what those are in our recommendations. Once that regulatory atmosphere is set, that investment will require private actions in the, term, in the hands of property owners, uh, business owners, and others. And those investments have to have the right regulatory context, but they also have to have the right context in terms of making an investment uh, in their own properties and making sure it makes financial sense. And then you all, uh, as members of the community, control aspects of this process as well. You hopefully, uh, once uh, you've heard the explanation of the recommendations this evening, uh, will support the zoning recommendations and understand their value and worth. But you also have the ability to support uh, future proposals and projects which come forward that are consistent with that zoning in the future. So community support for all of those investments is a big part of what makes a successful mixed-use development as well. Uh -oh. Let's see if I can get this to advance. We may have a few more technical difficulties. Oh, <laughs> Maybe it's my own user error with too many animations in a PowerPoint. All right, so we've been working closely throughout this process with a working group, a working committee, the B1 Working Committee, which has been uh, uh, representing a series of, or a, a nice representation of leadership in the town, as well as residents, which has helped to guide our recommendations uh, and the zoning uh, uh, considerations and analyses uh, we have not arrived at these recommendations alone. This has been a great uh, collaborative effort uh, and the result of an extensive process with this group uh, and also building upon the community meeting back in April uh, and working through that analysis. We've met with this group uh, about five, uh, not about, we've met with them exactly five times uh, through this process uh, and have very thoughtful and in-depth conversations about how these recommendations have been shaped uh, to get to this point. Back at that community workshop, uh, you all, many of you were here, so you'll recall that we engaged you in telling us how to shape these recommendations in 
uh, got some details about what you all would like to see building upon that vision that was articulated and specifically uh, characteristics of zoning and development that you would like to see in the town center. Uh, this is an example of the types of uh, feedback we received in that meeting about how tall future buildings should be. So uh, with consensus somewhere in the range of three to four stories, two to four stories, that sort of uh, feeling in terms of height. We also had a visual preference survey which resulted in a series of images which were preferred in terms of the look and feel, the character of the town center. You can see those most preferred images on the screen which have generous landscape, really nice, uh, well-designed sidewalks with interesting materials, walkable streetscapes uh, with uh, period and coordinated uh, streetscape and furnishings, uh, and then uh, buildings and architecture which are consistent with what you already have in Norfolk Town Center uh, and, and that promote activity, destinations, and outdoor gathering spaces. In addition to that community meeting, we also had uh, engaged the community with this online and paper survey, which is available both through the town's website uh, and at the library and town hall. Uh, and that received over 500 responses, which was fantastic. Uh, a great way to uh, get input on what those recommendations should be shaped to get your uh, understanding of how the specific elements of the zoning and design, gui design guidelines which we have uh, brought forward uh, should be shaped. And I think one of the really telltale signs of that engagement, uh, a justification for why we're going through all this effort and putting these recommendations forward is that a large percentage of the respondents to that survey uh, would classify themselves as neither satisfied nor dissatisfied, so neutral, or dissatisfied or extremely dissatisfied with town center today. So that's not, not a resounding vote for keeping things the way they are. It's actually wanting something a little bit better. Uh, and that's what these zoning recommendations are about. So with that background, uh, I'll jump right into the recommendations, which are the focus uh, of what we're doing tonight and will be the focus of the special town meeting article. So you should have, uh, as you came in, hopefully you signed in on our sign-in sheet so we can see how many people we had sp spoken to this evening. Uh, but you should also have grabbed a handout that looks like this. And if you didn't, you can shuttle over there and grab one. Also grab, grab some for your neighbors. We printed out a bunch this evening. We'll also have some copies at Town Hall available. This uh, one sheet is a zoning fact sheet summary that gives you in written form what I'll be covering here in the presentation. Uh, and we've tried to make it concise enough and straightforward enough that it actually fits on one sheet uh, and that it covers all of the changes that we're talking about. So it's comprehensive uh, and in summary form. And you can follow along as I go. I think my presentation is pretty much in the same order as the sheet. So starting off, uh, may, let me make a few comments in general about these zoning changes before we dive into the details. Uh, first, the changes are intended to make development investment in town center that is consistent with the community vision and to make development investment consistent with that vision more likely. So again, we can't control the outcomes, but we can make them more likely, and that's really what these uh, recommendations are focused on. Uh, and second, in terms of the zoning recommendations and, and whether or not you should pass them at town meeting, just to be very direct about it, I wouldn't view the choice as you can make these zoning recommendations and have change that may happen, uh, again, we can't control everything, or do nothing and no change will happen. I don't think that's the choice that's being made. I think the choice is more make the zoning recommendations and you can have development in town center which is more consistent with what the town wants and better guided towards that consistency or uh, the reality is development pressure in the town center will remain and you will continue to see development pressure in the form of 40b projects in the town center and those 40b projects are occurring in part today because the current zoning isn't viable for development to occur and we're highlighting the ways that development the way the changes that need to occur to make that development more viable 
so that it can occur through the guidance of zoning and not through mechanisms such as 40B. So that's, I think, the choice that we're, we're looking at and, and presenting to you. So the zoning recommendations, the district boundary does not change. So the way the, the district boundary is outlined today on the zoning map, uh, we're not recommending any boundary changes. Uh, we're not recommending any changes to the subdistricts. So there's the B1 core and the B1 outside the core. Those two subdistricts would remain, uh, and there's no changes to whether your property is in one or the other, or whether your property is in B1. So uh, if your property is there today, it re will remain there, uh, and no other properties adjacent to the district would be added in. So that's, that's one thing to be very clear about. And then the recommendations which we're making are all applying to the current language in the B1 district. Uh, so through this process, we actually uh, had, had gone through some iterations about how we should package the recommendations and what we should do. Uh, and at one point, we were uh, contemplating a more full replacement of the B1 district with a bunch of new language. Uh, and we decided not to do that, to actually just uh, edit what was there today to make it much clearer and, uh, and hopefully more predictable from the perspective of the town uh, because that language is known to you uh, and there's not a whole bunch of new uh, language or ideas to learn or think about. So we're working with the zoning section which is there today and basically editing it. And these are the edits which we're talking about. The first is regarding building scale. So there's language in the zoning today which states that no building footprint shall ex exceed 15,000 square feet. We're recommending that language be removed. Uh, in general, these changes are about removing impediments to development uh, in the current language of that section one, the B1 district, so that there's more of a chance that that development will be viable and be able to come forward through the zoning. An example about this building scale uh, language that we're, we're talking about removing I'm going to use 18 Union Street as an example, which is a recent development, and 194 Main Street as an example, which is a proposed development under review currently, a 40B project. So removing that language about a 15,000 square foot uh, building footprint, it actually, for a property like Union Street, it doesn't have that much of an impact on because it's a smaller property. So that's a 40,000 square foot lot. The footprint of that building which is going up right next to town hall is about 6,000 square feet. And under the new zoning, you wouldn't really be able to do, I mean, that, that's pretty much maximized or optimized as a site. So it's not like they would be able to then put a 25,000 square foot footprint on that property. That kind of is what it is. But the difficulty in that language comes when you have a property which is more the scale of 194 Main Street. And in the town center, there are some sizable properties such as that one. And that uh, lot size is 131,000 square foot. So no developer is ever going to propose a project which is 15,000 square foot or less. It's just not economical on a size of, of, of property that scale. So what you see is, a, is a, pro a development which instead is going around the current zoning rules to propose a property, a building, which has about a 30,000 square foot um, footprint. So you're seeing a, a uh, end around of those current rules. So if that's an impediment, we're basically removing it uh, and offering other guidance through design guidelines and other standards for parking, which will uh, still allow more, still require reasonably scaled building footprints without having an exacting absolute number of 15,000 square foot as a maximum. Similar and related to that, there's also language in the current uh, zoning related to building density that states no unit shall have more than two bedrooms and shall not exceed 16 bedrooms for any lot. This is a very similar uh, situation to what I just described and that it works all right for a smaller property. So again, the 40,000 square foot has resulted in eight units and that's about the optimized amount that you would get on a lot that scale. And on 194 Main Street, on a bigger lot, 
you see 72 units coming forward with that proposal. So the limitations of 16 bedrooms for any lot are, are really undercutting what the financial feasibility is for a project which would include a residential unit uh, mix. So we're uh, lifting that prohibition and maximum of 16 bedrooms. Moving on to building height. Currently, the allowed height is 40 feet to the peak of the roof by right, or 46 feet by special permit to the peak of the roof. We're recommending that that height be increased. Uh, adding flexibility to the height allows for a taller active ground floor, so the activity that we all want to see that was in that vision statement, uh, and more flexibility in the design of a pitched roof. And a pitched roof is a requirement because that's consistent with uh, the look and feel of Norfolk today. And helps the property uh, fit more active uses into the town center that can support a vibrant and active district. So we're suggesting that the maximum height be increased to the special, maximum height by right be increased to the current uh, special permit height of 46 feet. So that would be now 46 feet by right. And that those 46 feet be measured to the midpoint of the roof, so be between the slope and the eave, rather than the peak, just to add that additional flexibility. And the language today states that maximum height in terms of stories is three stories, and we would grant an extra half story within that pitch of the roof, so three and a half stories, which again, we believe is in alignment uh, more with economic viability for mixed-use development in the context of this town center. And you can see that diagrammed here, which as a diagram, uh, looking at the context of the town center today, we believe this is still aligned with the character and scale and, and compact development of the traditional New England town center, which Norfolk Center is. I'll pause here, actually, because I, I neglected to mention an important fact in the process, too. Um, in, in the series of meetings that we've had, we also met with the property owners and talked about, uh, at an initial level a uh, month or two ago, uh, the recommendations that were beginning to take shape and got their input as well. Um, and so these recommendations don't fully take into account what, what I would say were some of the um, desires that they expressed in that meeting, uh, but do, uh, I think, create a compromise position between potentially their comfort level, property owners and potential investors, and maybe your comfort level of what you're, where you're sitting at out in the room. Uh, and we think that that type of compromise, in, in our experience, has been uh, usually required to find that sweet spot in terms of actually making viable development come forward. And you can see uh, some of the, there are variations of course because it's an average figure, but you can see in this diagram some of the potential height and feet that would uh, result in 46 foot to the midpoint of that roof height. And some of the slopes which would show up on a roof with a minimum slope of five to 12 uh, and that, that pitched roof is a really important feature of the character of the town center. So I'll just keep moving along and, and give you a full view of what all the recommendations are and then we can, looks like, maybe move right into the discussion. Uh, so the next uh, point is about phase development. Uh, and there's language regarding uh, phasing in the current zoning. Uh, and we're adding a requirement uh, of a phasing plan. So there's phasing discussed uh, in, the, in the current requirements, but no phasing plan is required. So if a, if a developer were to come forward with a plan which has perhaps multiple buildings, uh, they would want to phase them potentially in a series of uh, construction periods, so one after another, you know, over maybe a period of years, 
we're requiring now that a plan be submitted to the town to actually outline what that plan of phasing would be and to clarify that any of the infrastructure requirements to be built out in that, uh, for that site would be required as part of that first phase so that it would allow um, the, uh, f both the flexibility from the development standpoint for phasing, but also uh, it would allow uh, the town to feel comfort that at least the site can be used for its full, more full uh, build out as was proposed in that full phased plan. And then the other point on this slide is regarding the residential buffer. Today the current language uh, in the zone has a minimum residential buffer of 50 feet to any uh, adjacent parcel that is residentially zoned. So any parcel which is not in the town center zoning but is adjacent to the town center and residentially zoned requires a 50 foot buffer. We're doing two things to the language in this uh, uh, point here. One is reducing the buffer from 50 to 30 feet. Uh, we feel that 30 feet is, remains a generous buffer and it would be filled with landscape to help screen to that adjacent property. Um, 50 feet for some of the properties is, is quite onerous uh, because they're not that large on the outside of the, pro outside of the district. And a 50 foot buffer would eat into a fair amount of their developable area. And we're also clarifying the language to state that it applies to abutting properties. So not properties across the street, which are residentially zoned. The current language doesn't, isn't clear on that and could create confusion. Uh, as to where that buffer should occur. And if you take the clarified language uh, which we've articulated there, this is where that 50 foot buffer would occur in areas adjacent to the town center district. So that would be 30 feet now. So next, there's a uh, build to line in the current language. That's effectively a distance which is uh, the minimum and maximum which a building must land within uh, as measured from the front of a lot. So that's between six feet and nine feet. Uh, we are making a minor cleanup where we're aligning the minimum front setback with that distance. So it's six feet. And then also clarifying that Again, in a, build, in a site plan with multiple buildings, that only one primary building is required to be within that setback or within that build two line. Uh, and that allows a development of the kind where perhaps you'd have a mixed use building at the front of the property, which has helped defining that street edge and the, the character of the, the streetscape. And then you might have some supporting buildings to the rear of the property if that works best with their site plan. Uh, and that would be allowed. So not every building would have to line up within that build two line. And here you can see that notion of a build two line. So between six and 19 feet from that front property edge uh, is where you'd have at least one primary building landing and located. And next is a change to uh, lot requirements. In the course of our analysis, we found several lots that don't comply with the current minimum lot size. Uh, and the minimum lot size effectively would reduce the amount of properties which could pursue the same opportunities that we're trying to create in the town center. So those properties which we have determined are these. So those are all less than the current minimum lot size of 30,000 square feet. So if we were to adjust the minimum lot size downward to 15,000 square feet, each of these parcels would be brought into having the same opportunities that we're trying to create for the others without having to uh, combine themselves with another adjacent parcel. So I think that's a pretty straightforward change that just uh, evens the opportunity. Smaller parcels may still find it advantageous to try to uh, combine with other parcels to become a larger parcel, uh, but that would not be required under this change. And then relating to uh, the 
previous recommendations which deal with density and the amount that can be viably built on a property, parking is a big part of that equation. So parking uh, in the town center where we're promoting a compact, mixed use, walkable and vibrant place, uh, parking is an important aspect of development, but it shouldn't be treated the same as you would treat it in a uh, sort of car devoted subdivision or a different part of the town which doesn't have uh, commuter rail access or other uses within walkable distances or a mix of uses. So we want to take advantage of what the town center has to offer and provide more ability to build buildings that require a little less parking. Uh, so we're moving uh, the required parking uh, for a residential unit from its current requirement of one and a half spaces per unit down to one space per unit. And that's consistent with what we've seen in terms of transit-oriented uh, development and the, the ability in this context for a household to live well with one car uh, when they also have the ability to walk to things or hop on the commuter rail. Uh, and that that is a really at a, a competitive advantage for the units that would be located in the town center. Uh, and so you, you want to encourage that and encourage, therefore, the density of those uses that can build up with each other over time. So that's an important aspect of it. Another important aspect of those mix of uses is that oftentimes the parking that's provided gets used at different times of the day. So a residential unit may need their parking space over the nighttime period when they're back from their day. Uh, a retail shop may have a peak demand time in the afternoon or some combination thereof. And, and a developer can prove out to the town with their own mix of uses that they might have some advantageous sharing of parking which is occurring. So over the 24 hours of a day, you might be able to service all your parking needs with a few less parking spaces because they can use the same spot at different periods. So the current zoning allows for 30% uh, of the parking area to be reduced but not eliminated so that that space still has to be devoted and retained on site, which isn't really an advantage to the developer uh, or to the project. So we're suggesting that the we would go a step further and allow the shared parking, if it could be proved out as, as viable and possible, that that could be then a 30% reduction and elimination. So you wouldn't have to hold space for it. It could just be flat out removed. And then there are some clarifications regarding uses. Uh, the first of one is fundamental to everything I've been talking about, and that's uh, stating language clearly in the zoning that says town center projects uh, shall be mixed use. Uh, so there's no, no language that says that in the zoning today, and that's very important. So we're not trying to build a town center which is of only one use. We're trying to create a vibrant mix of uses that's uh, fundamental to the uh, vision statement I shared with you. Uh, and so that is, is included. Uh, any use that is in the use table of allowed uses could be combined with another use and that would count as mixed use. And the way that we're measuring the amount of uses so that, uh, for example, you don't get a 100% residential project that's mixed with a tiny ATM at the corner of the lot. That would be an example of a mixed use, I guess. But we're trying to prevent that type of approach by uh, the next sentence, which requires uh, the majority, 51% of ground floor street frontage to be devoted to active allowed uses. So those would be uh, presumably non-residential uses uh, on the ground floor, which are really where you want them to occur, which would be helping with the vibrancy of the town center. The other area, so that's not an area figure, it's a um, percentage figure. So the area could be figured out uh, by the development team to understand their own economics of what they're trying to make work. The remaining area could be used as residential or other uses on the ground floor, uh, but we'd be requiring more than half of that ground floor to be contributing to that mixed use town center. And then we're also in the next bullet modifying residential dwelling units uh, to remove the 
condition which sort of was the previous equation for the one we've just replaced it with, uh, which was to require uh, not let 65% or less of the total combined square footage of, uh, would be co limited to commercial uses. So one of the things that we've talked a lot about in, in our meetings, both as a working committee and we heard a lot from property owners, was that a, a measure which is a percentage of square footage is very difficult to comply with uh, on the development side of things. So we've tried to come up with a different metric to make that work. Uh, and we think that the one that we've used and have tested a number of ways uh, is, a, is a good approach. And so there you can see how that might play out in the diagram I've been using. So those two bays of the ground floor would have to be active uses of some kind. So a cafe, um, health center, what, who knows what it, what it would be, but active uses which would be on the allowed list of uses or the special permit list of uses, but then if, if they included a special permit use, they, that whole project would be a part of a special permit application. So they, they, there would be advantages to sticking to the allowed uses. And then the other uses could be, uh, like for example here, like this might be a residential unit, but that's okay because you actually have some activity occurring in the other parts. Maybe these are entries for a residential uh, above, and that would be fine too. One of the advantages of uh, a complementary advantage to setting up this way is that uh, residential buildings of this height, uh, it's difficult to make them work uh, financially with an elevator. It's difficult to make them work from accessibility standpoints without an elevator except if you do create some space for residential units on the ground floor, it makes, it makes it potentially an easier thing to achieve to pass accessibility requirements with those units on the ground floor providing the accessible uses. And then there's two other use items which we've cleaned up in the zoning today. There's limited use Limited used motor vehicle sales is currently an allowed use, and we would be moving that to the list of prohibited uses. We don't think that is a consistent use with what the vision for town center is. I don't believe there are any limited used motor vehicle sales today, uh, so that, that would be a change that would, I think, be relatively smooth. And the other one is uh, gas and diesel filling stations. There is a gas station in the town center today. That use would be uh, grandfathered in, uh, so it would still be able to be active use, uh, still be able to invest in their own property, ma maintain their property, but we wouldn't want to see future properties become gas stations in the town center because I don't think that's also consistent with the vision that's been articulated. So those are, that is the package of zoning recommendations, which we believe uh, provide a very straightforward and accessible way to invite more viable uh, development in the town center that's consistent with the vision that you've all articul articulated. I'll pause here to see if there's specific questions about what I've just presented. Yeah. Yes. Where is 194 Main Street? Can you just scroll back to there? Yeah, so that's here, okay. so Main Street comes up. This is the library, yep. town hall. So there are some, I guess, buildings there that will come down. Here's my main question. <coughs> You're increasing bedrooms. You're decreasing parking. You're decreasing shared parking. Seriously, it's nice to say people are going to use the train but they're not taking the train to the grocery store. They're not taking the train unless they use the little little uh, hardware store in town. They're not, they're not doing their business. Many people are not, work not in the town. You're creating what's gonna be a nightmare, frankly, by not having enough parking. You have four bedrooms, you think you're only gonna have one driver? Yeah, I think that, uh... I don't think you'll be creating a nightmare. I do think that 
the people that choose to live in a new unit in your town center are probably making that choice because they have a little bit different preferences than the, the typical uh, suburban household. Um, what we found, we did a recent study as an agency, MAPC, uh, where we've gone to multifamily properties in the dead of night and surveyed their parking lots to see how many spaces were used. That's like something we creepy planners do, like we're just looking around in people's parking lots. Um, unfortunately, we didn't do it in the town of Norfolk, but we did do it in, I forget how many, it was like a good, good sample, a little closer in uh, to Boston, but it wasn't the city of Boston. It was places like Medford and Arlington and those, those places, which have some substantial multifamily development occurring. And, and what we found was on average, of all the parking that's getting built, and some of it at very low ratios, like lower than what we're saying here, so below one per unit, only 85% of the spaces being built are being used. So what that means, so you know, what it means is that that development is costing more to build because they're building parking that they don't need, uh, and the lot size that was required to put those buildings up was larger than it needed to be too. And what we're doing in places which could be very vibrant, compact, and walkable places, we're stretching them out ever so slightly by more and more parking. So it is, I mean, it's a, it's a shift from the way things have been done in the recent decades of development. Uh, and I understand that, and it creates certain unease. Um, but what we're finding more and more is that there are certain households, whether they be um, towards the end of a career or towards the beginning of a career. So, you know, young professional household, millennials or retirees, those sorts of populations, more and more are trying to self-select places which, where they can live to not solely depend on a car, which means that they can own less cars. Um, and so we, we're seeing that play out place in place again and, and what it does, that little leap of faith to get to reduce parking actually does help create a vibrant place in the end. Um, so I know it's not, I mean, I, I get pushed back on this answer a lot, um, but it, is, it, it does require a little bit of a leap of faith, but we have seen it work in many places. Yes, sir. On the uh, 30,000 square lot, yeah. how many apartment buildings, how many apartments do you think you can fit there, 100 to 300? On any 30,000 square foot lot? Or I'm wondering how many apartments, how many, how many residents you could fit if that building was an apartment building three and a half to four stories high. I'm estimating around 100 or so, or maybe 200, if that was just all apartments. Over the whole town center? No, well, imagine 31,000. In, uh, in, in the 30,000 square foot piece. You showed a piece where it was an extended piece. Not just, it seems very, very possible that it could be um, small apartment buildings for a commuter to Boston, for low income, things like that. So I'm just, I'm just trying to get an estimate of what it could be, what number it could be. Because it certainly has the potential to be that. 194 million, I think. I don't have that calculation off the top of my head, how many, how many buildings in a third, or how many units. But I, I think, um, let me actually skip ahead to a slide to help talk about this. If you permit one more. Sure. Okay, let me, let me address that question first. So the question is, is this land available or will it be taken by eminent domain or, or other means? So we're not, we're not talking in any way about eminent domain in this. It's not even a discussion point or a possibility. What we're doing is changing the municipal zoning regulations or recommending that they be changed so that private investment can occur on private properties. So it, it is not the town. The town is making the changes to the regulations. It would be private investment which would be required. Um, so the town has no ambitions or desire to uh, uh, procure any of these properties and develop them themselves. That's not 
even in the realm of consideration. And then this, this area that I've outlined on this diagram here is the area of town center which is more, more likely to be the focus of these regulatory changes. So you, you all are familiar with, where's my red dot here? So these areas here are mostly uh, green fields today. They're literally lawns. So they are not developed in any way, which make them very attractive to development and the mixed use development that we're talking about. So those would be the most likely targets that you would see short-term investment which would be consistent with the regulations that we're talking about. Once those investments are made over time, you might see some reinvestment in some of those core properties which are right on Main Street and, or at Rockwood Road. And, but those properties are developed today and they would need, the economics of the town center would need to be a little different to make the incentive good enough for them to reinvest in their property in that way. But over time, what you're trying to see is get investment in these properties. So really, it, it does become a multi-block area that's a pleasant place to walk from end to end. And that isn't what it is today. And I think you could have uh, restaurants, shops, a mix of uses, things that make it possible to go to the grocery, uh, get your groceries at a small local shop, which is a part of town center, and not have to drive out to it. But what we're talking about, just to be clear, is not developing all of those properties for residential uses. The mixed use requirement and that requirement of the active uh, frontage of 51%, we think are the major points which uh, are there as guarantees to make this a mixed use district. Without those and without changes to the zoning, I fear where you may head toward is more of a residential only town center because that's what you've seen happen in the last few years with the 40B proposals that have come forward. And those, so we're, in a way, we're, we're trying to create a recipe for zoning which is attractive enough that we can compete with the unconstrained uh, local, or local regulations which is the 40B mechanism. And the 40Bs which have come forward have no requirement to provide uses other than residential. So we're trying to insert that in such a way that we still think viable projects can come forward, but they would have more benefit to the town and to the town center. So that's, that's the, so I don't have a, a number in terms of units. I mean, we can talk about the, the 194 Main Street is 72 units, and that's on a 30,000 square foot lot. So that gives you, and they've tried, probably tried to maximize that as best they can. Uh, we are, I haven't talked about it yet. I will talk about it in the presentation in a few moments. The zoning is one part of the development equation on these sites. Uh, wastewater treatment is another major component. Parts of the town center district are on a uh, shared uh, wastewater treatment system. Other parts are not. So there, are, there will be other major limitations to the density and amount of units that you can achieve on a site based upon uh, septic design, uh, septic system design and Title V requirements and Board of Health regulations. So there's a, there's a lot of, there's other complex and dynamic regulations which are applied to these properties. Um, but we are not, we're, we're actually trying to open the door for mixed use development and not just let, let the door wide open for residential only. The only reason I ask the question is because, you know, we're, we're very familiar with somebody's kind of investment and how they can utilize that investment up on the question and your comments. So the 40B project proposed at 194 Main Street, it's 130,000 square foot lot, so it's much larger than oh, sorry. the yeah. 30,000 square foot lot, right? Um, I think that's an important clarification. It is also, the building that's being proposed there would not meet the, the zoning changes that are being proposed here today. It, that, that, zone, that building would still not be an as-of-right building 
based on the proposed changes that we're discussing here today. Correct. All that being said, it's in this developer's best interest to maximize the number of housing units on that site, right? On a huge site compared to a 30,000 square foot site. And he's still only putting in 72 units. So, you know, if the fear of a 200 or, three, or a 300 unit site, it's just, it's not even viable on a 130,000 square foot site, let alone a 30,000 square foot site. So that's some math there to take into consideration. The other thing, I, maybe just to, before we do some more questions, the, in the context of a mixed-use vibrant center, residential units aren't bad either. I mean, they are, they are thriving contributors to the economics of the town center, and the local households are local dollars spent in those businesses, shops, and retail stores, uh, which will be looking for households to support them. So uh, th there are... I understand there are other considerations that come along with households and new households, um, but there, there's a benefit to what they bring as well. Some other hands. Yes. Thank you. Um, could you or Rich speak to the fact that apartments actually help us meet our 40B requirements? I think that's something that maybe people don't understand. Yes, yeah, so uh, the question is, speaking to apartments actually helping to meet 40B requirements, so the uh, town of Norfolk does have an inclusionary housing bylaw today. So uh, we haven't included uh, affordable language in our zone because it's covered more broadly in the uh, zoning bylaw of the town. Uh, but a requirement of 10%, 10% of the units uh, which are built, so any of the projects which would be built under this new zoning, 10% of their units would be required to be affordable units those units would be uh, applicable and can be applied to the affordable housing rosters of the town to help uh, contribute to that overall number as you're trying to reach and match that 10% requirement of the state. Uh, so that's, that's an important aspect too of this uh, housing production potentially is that it, is, it can also help kind of get the uh, town of Norfolk out of this uh, Respond, needing to respond to 40B proposals as they're brought forward and put you more in control. So I just had, oh, go on, go on. I just had one quick question. What about the stock and shop property? What's happening with that? Is that just sitting there? Has to be bought it? There's a big part of the main street that the stock and shop owned. So the stock and shop site right now is uh, it's under a multi-year lease for Eastern Development. Corporation, which is holding it for stop and shop. And essentially, the terms of that lease are, uh, from what I understand, about half a million dollars a year. So, a lease of that magnitude and with the, the market conditions, you know, the property owner is holding the lease, is happy to get a half a million dollars a year. <coughs> um, and stop and shop, on the other hand, would probably like to get out of it. But the cost to do that right now, because of the terms of the lease, they can't afford to do that. So at the moment, it's kind of as a stalemate. However, um, we are keep moving towards you know, the term going, you know, decreasing, where there might be that point where why they can, they can do it. But they're basically on hold right now. So there was a time when they, quite honestly, they didn't build the store and then they probably wanted to keep it from a competitive standpoint. But today with the grocery market industry the way it is and the other stop and shops, it's not that advantageous to them. So they have been trying to get out of that. It's just the numbers are still very high to do that at the present. If, if somebody came up with the money to buy it, could they put apartment buildings there? They could, could under, the, under the zoning, yes. Yeah, so. Yes. They, no. they, no. So they can or can't, if they bought, if somebody bought the property, you know, the $500 million is probably nothing in today's marketplace, could they build apartment buildings on that piece of property? So they could build apartments through that mix, which we're talking about, yeah, through our zone environment. Um, if it included other uses yeah, mixed with it. Had mixed use, other uses. Okay. Yeah. They could also do that today. They could do that today. Yeah. 
It's, it's very similar to a, a situation in Framingham. There's a village in Framingham called Knobscot, which has a supermarket lease on a property in a, a vacant strip mall. And the process which now the city of Framingham, they were the town back a few years ago when this process started for them, the, the process that they've undergone is, has many similarities to this in that they figured out that a part of the untwisting of those dynamics of the leasehold was actually passing zoning so that the development that could possibly come out of that lease negotiation would result in enough value that it made sense to all parties involved to proceed with a new development. So I think that this type of, uh, these types of zoning changes that we're recommending would be advantageous in potentially helping to unlock that um, relationship that you see with the supermarket leasehold there. Other questions? I'm just yeah. curious, how long has the stop on shop um, hold been going on? We've lived here 11 years, and it's always been that way. I think it's 96. <coughs> there was no legal, like we couldn't have the lawsuit. I mean, it seems absurd that they could literally just hold this land hostage for years and years. They own it. They own it. They own it. And you own yours, they own it. Yeah. They own it. That's a big consideration. We're a holding company. Yeah, Eastern Development yeah. owns the property. Yeah, it's not a stop and shop. Okay. Or at least see I think to it's it. important to reiterate the point that Rich made that the holding company owns the property. Stop and Shop pays them every year for the right to develop it in the future. Right. Yeah. And just as Josh had mentioned earlier, some of those the property owners meetings that we did have, we actually had Eastern Development there, and we also had uh, the real estate colliers as the broker for Stop and Shop, and they both were at at the meeting, and. They liked what we were doing, but from their standpoint, it didn't go far enough to, to tip the scale. So just to be, I know we're, we're improving things, but from their standpoint, we didn't go far enough to make things happen. So I just want you to be clear that it's, it, would, it can happen, but I think what they were talking about, if you were concerned about what we were trying, like these concepts, they would want to go even further. So was trying to meet, as what Josh said, trying to create a, a, a middle ground that people could support. Go, Marcia, go. Can I just ask you? Sorry, let's, yeah, let's go here and then we'll sure. go around. Okay. We've been waiting a long time. Okay. Uh, let's see maximum height. I mean, we'll buy a bomb and then say we try to buy it currently. I don't know the answer to that. Well, we're building buildings that we didn't even know if the fire department can handle it. If they have to go out and buy a ladder truck, that's over six hundred thousand dollars in taxpayer money. Well, you're talking fifty-three feet tall plus a couple, a couple of how do you people say it? Thank you. Of at least fourteen feet, so you're talking almost seventy feet tall. And if our fire department cannot safely fight a fire at that, you got to get another truck, and another truck is six hundred thousand dollars. Hmm? Well, I hope you're right. We, we do have a ladder truck. Yeah, we do. We do. Don't build the fire department tall. <laughs> we have to hire tall fire. Um, okay. We also we have restricted we have restricted days for when we can use water. We've just recently had a tap into an aquifer, and also I've been informed that the tower and the pump is not necessarily sufficient to give enough water now during possible peak times. How are we going to address that when there's so much more people and businesses as far as the water itself? Uh-oh. Yeah, I, I actually haven't, I haven't heard issues about the water supply. Um, but if, so. So let me try to answer it this way, I think. So the water to a degree that we're talking about here is the consumptive side of it, so it's, you know, it's, you know the part of the water, using it. Um, the water, part of the water issues that we have today is, it's not just, you know, people want to use it to water 
and you know beyond just the consumption side. So um, that's a town-wide issue um, that we need to manage. So there's less water. I mean, these would be built with more water consumption, you know, water savers and so forth to help with that. But as you see, the new building that's going up on Union Street, if you drive by, um, they have landscaping, but they're they're landscaping it to reduce the amount of water that is being needed. Same thing with these. These buildings, as they do at the sound center, won't be it'll be for consumption, you know, so water, you know, drinking, cooking, waste water, that so we still have to deal with it, but it's also based on a per bedroom basis. So think about well, I, I think that should be dealt with in advance before we build buildings. So we are, so the town is in the process of putting the whole, whole Brook Street well on. We're gonna to go to town meeting in November to do some zoning changes. And that will be from us. And then we're looking for future water supply. Yes. Uh, I think I can help answer two, two right. questions. First one is the, uh, the aerial ladder can reach 110 feet. So I think that three and a half stories should be fine. And the Holbrook well is more for redundancy of, we only have two wells right now, so we need to be able to rest them once in a while. It's not about um, drawing more water. We're not, we haven't asked the state for the, uh, the authority to pull out more water than we have approval for today. It's more about being able to rest one well, work another well, and make sure that we're um, pulling water out of the aquifer appropriately. I could also add to that, Rich, that the, the, water, the water planning is there anyway. Um, the, the town does not meet its 40 year requirements. So any developer could come in at any one of these sites and put on high density housing development by state law. And the town would have to provide the infrastructure for that development regardless. So, uh, you know, Josh mentioned something towards the beginning of this meeting where we can try to effectively, responsibly plan for this development, or we can let developers come in under the 40B law and do what they want. That's sick. <coughs> in, in fairness just to my comments, the huge apartment buildings going up downtown Walpole, that's a town center. That's, that's just my concern. God forbid something like that is allowed up here. It would be very, very disastrous, I think, for remaining residents in this community. So the one good thing, at least we've done a lot of good things tonight, but we can tell you, hopefully, we've done a lot of good things. <laughs> that project there is what I've heard a lot about or read about and so forth. I guess it depends how you want to look at it. I think in this case, the good news is that wouldn't be allowable under what we're talking about. But it would be by a 40B. They could still come in and do it by 40B. Right. So we're not... Solving our 40B problem, we're just trying to prevent or make it more inviting to come in and build something within using the planning board instead. Correct? Yeah, we're trying to get a property owner that feels like they're stuck in a box with our present zoning, and the only way out is 40B to hopefully get them to, to do development that's within our zoning body. So, can you use 194 Main Street as an example of how by right? that developer, what it would look like under your recommendations. And then my second question, because I'm not sure I'll get another opportunity, um, is could you keep the parking at 1.5 and leave it to the discretion of the planning board based on the site, based on the plan, and not by right make it one? Yeah, yeah I, well, you could do that. Uh, for, to answer the second question what first. What would be the disadvantage of, of holding on to that control a little bit and giving the planning board what, what we're offering them here? Well, I think that um, our, in our field in planning for more pedestrian scaled development, we're moving away from parking minimums as a practice because they actually are artificial minimums. They're based upon kind of wacky uh, science that really has uh, not great founding. Um, so that its origin, where it, this might get to be a little too long of an answer, but the Institute of Traffic Engineers created a uh, parking manual which they surveyed sites uh, back many years ago and they update them occasionally. Uh, but they're looking at sites all over the country and counting the number of cars that go with that use and so forth. 
Uh, and that's where most parking generation uh, comes from. Uh, and so what we're seeing is that parking minimums, uh, you, what you're seeing is that the um, developers are building more parking than they have to because they're required to. So we're trying to pull that down to a minimum that would provide the comfort level to the town, but not be over what the developer would be building for the marketplace. There's a reasonable chance that at one per unit, a developer might actually propose more than the minimum if they think that's what they need to market their units or to market their property. Um, but I think it's better to leave it, therefore, at the that would be at the discretion of the developer right. and not at the discretion of the planning board, which I think is a little bit better because you don't have that, the uh, more of a chance that you will accidentally require more parking than is needed that no one really wants. I think that's what we're trying to get is off, off of that as the default. That right now, everyone, and it's not just Norfolk, it's, a, it's most of the region, is still in a place where they're building and requiring more parking than is needed as a default, and we're trying to move away from that. On the, on the 194 Main Street part of your question, I think that the big difference would be it would not be a 100% residential project, which it is today. It would have at least 51% 50 per, of its ground floor, which is facing Main Street, would be other uses than residential. Um, and those uses uh, would add to the vibrancy as you move down Main Street from the commuter rail station. And I think right now, uh, with that project being all residential, it potentially has the, uh, it closes down the opportunity to expand the mixed use town center in that direction over time. And I think with the, it being a more recent investment, like that's a real, that's a real sort of lost opportunity that could be better used for the town center. Thank you. Here. Yeah, just a couple more points on that one, just to compare. So um, the other thing about that development, if it were under the zoning bylaw, it would fall under the Board of Health regulations. So the wastewater requirements in the Board of Health regulations are more stringent. So that would even be, it wouldn't be able to, you know, the density would be reduced as well. So on, as a 40B, they're following the Title V regulations to get the density. Right now, it's presently, um, it might change, but right now it's 55 and over, which the design flow for 55 and over is even lower than non-55, again, because not to get too crazy, but then you get up to a cap flow per property and then the economics kind of change. But just generally speaking, that's some of the points between the two. Rich. Yep. Um, hearkening back to the Stop and Shop property, uh, Ray Murphy, who's one of the partners at Eastern Development, the lessor of the Stop and Shop site, basically told the people assembled there that there were seven years left on that lease. Now, we all know that Stop and Shop's now come in here. Sometimes you build for offense, sometimes you buy for defense. This is a defensive part, posture. My question is this, is I'm assuming that their original permits have long expired, but the reason why they sit there on a piece of land and a half million bucks a year to Ajo is a rounding error. Take away the incentive of what they're defending against, which is a 55,000 square foot by right supermarket in zoning, and you'll probably see them wipe their hands of the place. And it could be repurposed for something else that may be in more interest to the town and the town's people. And, and that is actually what you're seeing play out in Framingham, that, that a development proceeding which actually removes that fear of competition is what's unlocking that situation. Land banking has been going on in the grocery business forever. Just pull up any one of the major chains, Google it, it's been going on all over New England and other populated states forever. Yes, sir. No, that was my question. Um, with the $15,000 thousand square foot getting removed, what's to stop another grocery store from buying 35, 40,000 square feet going a big Y here? Is there a way like eliminate gas stations limit? Was one of them eliminating, limiting the car sales? 
Hmm. Look at the square footage a grocery can be and make it like a brother's at 10,000 so that a big box store can't just come in and so I can go 60,000 square feet. Yeah, that could be a, a, one of the prohibited uses, a condition around that that is put I together. I was on the board similarly, they capped the grocery, I think it was at 15,000, trying to draw in a brother's or mm -hmm. something smaller and, and keep the charm of the town. I think if you get rid of that 15,000 square feet, you open it up to yeah. who knows what. Yeah. Or make them build multiple property buildings on that, that footage. You know, instead of one big one, they gotta build four at 15,000. They can't build one at 60. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so the, the, the question was if you remove the square footage limitations on the footprint, do you open yourself up as a town to the ability of some big supermarket or other entity to come in, get a bunch of property, and then plop that thing down? Um, and it, would it be valuable to consider in the uses, the allowed uses, some sort of cap on allowed uses for grocery stores or other big boxes to say 15 or 20,000 square feet. But for like one tenant, you know, yeah. it could be. Which is, which is a reasonable protection. I think that um, my perception of what we've heard about Norfolk Center from property owners and from our understanding of market conditions, I don't think it's a likely risk that you would see one of those types of box entities come in here, even if they had the opportunity, because you, I mean, the opportunity is there today, and it's not happening. Um, so, I, but I think as an extra protection, that might be something to explore. I thought it was fifteen thousand now. Square feet was a max of building. No, you can do large adapter grocery store. Okay. We well, originally changed the zoning fifteen years ago to accommodate the stop and shop right. to get the approval that they held, and now is expired. Take away the incentive; it'll free up the property. Yes. Hi. Um, I, I manage a lot of apartments, and I just um, I just want to kind of clarify things. The, the one parking space would be for a two-bedroom unit. Is that what you're proposing? One parking it's, space it's, for two bedrooms. It's per unit. Okay. So it would be, it would be a two-bedroom unit. A any size. Any any unit. any size bedroom unit. Okay. So. Effectively, it becomes an average. So it's, it's probably a little too large. So if you have a studio or one bedroom, it's, it's a pretty big requirement. If you have a three bedroom, it's a little bit small. Okay. Um, but it does average out. Because you're not going to get a lot of people, I can tell you from what I rent, if you have only one parking space and you're not going to have a lot of people renting it, they will rent, but you're not going to have a family for it. You're not going to have, you may have a family, younger family people, three or retired. So the, the point, just so everyone can hear the, and make sure I understood it correctly, the point that was made is that the, the parking, the lower parking provision uh, would, would not attract residents, family residents, um, because they wouldn't want to have that few parking spaces as their, for their apartment. The is first that? thing tenants worry about are yeah. their cars. They're not going to go park in a shared parking space where there's a bank or there's a risk of being towed go across near the library, it's not going to be that messy in one place. If they're not going to have the parking space they want, they're going to move on to the next unit. Someone that has one car, that has a little less, you know, baggage or family, whatever, will take those units. So you're not going to have these big, big families in these units. This is just my own professional thing. You can just wait. Have you been waiting, right? Yep. Yeah. So I just want to clarify, and I think maybe you would answer this more than possibly you, but are you saying that anything that goes in the town center right now would have to still have that requirement for 10% affordable housing? Yes. Did I yes. Okay. yes. And then the other question I have with that is um, how do you, so if you have mixed use and you have, I don't know exactly how to frame it, but I'm going to frame it best I can. You're saying like requirement of one parking spot and shared parking. It seems to me that one gets help the I'm thinking of, not just Josie's concerns, but how am I, as a person who's going to drive there, going to feel comfortable going there, that I'm going to get a parking spot? I'm not going to keep going back to the restaurant or the 
coffee shop or whatever and find I can't find that's a parking Franklin. spot. <laughs> right. That's so why there are no cafes in downtown. That's, there's, there's a, that's a real legitimate. So are we going to create oh, a so special parking lot or something? So I mean, the, how do we do that? The parking for the residential piece of it, the yep. one yep. for union, the parking for a restaurant or an office would be based on the other requirements. So it would be based on the mix of the uses. So the, right now we have one for two, three hundred square feet. I'm sorry, what's that? One for three hundred square feet. Okay. And one parking spot for three hundred square feet. Right. So it's, it's going to be a combination of what that allow you. So we have different use categories. So we're just talking about the residential side of it. Um, so okay. yeah, it would be a mix of that's a great question and a good point to clarify because yeah. we hadn't highlighted that here. So what we're changing is the residential requirements, but the other requirements for providing parking for commercial, retail, restaurant uses would remain as they are. I think people have really legitimate concerns. I really do. I mean, but the thing is, I understand what you're trying to say is we have 40B or we have this. And the only way we're going to win against 40B in any capacity is if we have something that can give people it. That's, I agree with you 100%. Was there a question on this site? Yes, sir. We've got two major problems in the center. One's the septic and the other's the dam. Unless we put a septic system in this town, we're going nowhere. We re regionalized all our schools, which is the same as taking all your little cesspools and putting them all together. We did the same. We put together all our dispatch areas. We can't have individual septic areas all over the place and get it to work. The second one, the dam, is the dam trap. Already it is unbelievable. The trailer trucks going through the center of town. Everything is stopped when a train goes through. Now you're going to get more stoppage. We got two tracks instead of one. I've been pushing for septic in this town for over 15 years when I was on the building committee. I started. We have to do something with it. Traffic-wise, a lot of these vehicles that are coming into this town are coming in from the Franklin area. At one time, we were going to have a bridge going over at the end of Boardman Street. They wanted to put parking, additional parking, up in the back area. They were going to move from the center of town behind Dunkin' Donuts. They were going to open all that up. That whole area is useless without any septic. We're looking to do a new fire station. The fire station has a $250,000 septic system that was put in behind there that is next to useless already. Once they start adding more stuff to it, doing work around it, it's going to fail. We're going to throw more money into it. Why? Because we do not have a septic system. So it's, everything we're doing is mute until we get some sort of way of handling the septic in the town. Plus, the town will make money. Yes, Rich. I disagree with the gentleman about bringing a sewer system into the town center because that will just open the floodgates for development and we'll end up with something like we have in Walpole, which is right on the screen. Um, if we brought, and, and that was brought to town meeting, like you said, in 2010, and the people in Norfolk voted it down because for one reason, the town was going to have to pay the tab for the septic system or sewer system. And the second reason we realized that it would uh, you know, open the floodgates for development in downtown. I, I think that um, I think the re reality on sewer is that it, it will be required to achieve um, a level of density that we're talking about in many of the sites that we're talking about. And, and I don't think that, I mean, we, Walpole's also in our region, so I think that for Walpole, this is, is a good project, and I think it's a contrib contribution to the region. But this isn't the type of project that we're talking about for Norfolk Center. So this is taller. This is, uh, does not have a uh, pitched and sloped roof form, which would be a requirement. And it's not as compact and as broken down uh, to fit with the context of Norfolk Center as will be uh, required through guidance of the design guidelines, which I haven't gotten into talking about yet. So, I, I mean, it's a, a little bit of a shame this has been up on the screen for so long, because this isn't actually representative of what we're talking about 
here, so maybe I'll flip, flip to a different image. Um, but I do think that the, the septic and sewer is a very interesting discussion in concept. Um, there, of course, is some capacity in the system which already exists up the hill uh, that could be used on properties like those around that stop and shop site that we've been talking about so much. Um, but then properties down the hill don't have access to that shared sewer system. And there would be benefits to the town to expanding that over time. Um, but, and I don't think it would necessarily mean that you, this is where you're headed in the future. I think that the regulations that we're talking about uh, would provide, hopefully, a happier middle ground that represent more of what Norfolk is wanting than what you see here. So with that, I, I will that a, flip is off. Is that a by right, Patrick? Yes. That's by right? There That's what I heard, yes. It's not a 40 bit. No. Okay. Neither one. Okay. Who would be responsible for the septic if that actually was put into the town center? Would it be the residents that are currently here? No. So the one we have applied for a uh, grant through the state to look at the wastewater treatment plant in the center of town, which Josh touched upon. The, if you want to, some of the properties that the stop and shop property, the ones that are on the front, the green area, the green uh, baby property. Is, is tied into the, the wastewater treatment plant. That was part of original development design that the town ended up taking, from my understanding, gifted to the town because the developer didn't fulfill their obligations with that wastewater treatment plant. So the town operates that wastewater treatment plant and the people that have, are flowing into it are paying for it along with people like Stop and Shop and the other properties out there, they're paying for an allocational share of that wastewater treatment plant. What we're looking at investigating is that there's unused capacity right now that they're, that people are paying for and potentially use that for development in the town's, in this town center area. That would be paid for by the sewer users and by the district. So that's why it's a little more complicated. I know there was, they tried to do it back in 2010 but what we're looking at here, if it's feasible, is the users, just like the water users as an enterprise, would be having to do the capital cost of the system and then tie into it. So it would be operated by them. They would be paying for it, utilize it, not the rest of the town residents. So, you know, wastewater treatment plants and wastewater is a, is a many towns and cities is an enterprise. Um, I mean, some might not be, but that's, that was the objective there. And then based on the design flow, so much capacity. So I don't know what sewer limitations they have in Walpole and what their limits are, but that wastewater treatment plant is 30,000 gallons a day right now. So to increase the capacity, there's probably going to be an economic push point that we're not, you know, that we're not going to be able to do it. So. While that could happen there, I don't want to say like, you know, the door is open because it's, there's quite a bit of work and cost to get there with the wastewater. Yes. I'm sorry, um, is, some, if, is some of the um, uh, business um, development you're proposing where uh, Meeting House Hill is, where the other condos are? Yeah, that would be uh, within the district that we're talking about. So on Mean House Road here, there, um, the vacant parcels are along that so edge of the road. Hill, so it's, it's not all condensed in one area. Right. No, yeah, that, so that there's some up there, and then there's some parcels down, again, along Main Street, uh, some adjacent to the commuter rail remote parking lot. So yeah, there are, there are several areas in the town center which, which could be uh, encouraged to redevelop. So what you don't see on this is the new condos on Meeting House up on the right hand side. So they're there, doesn't see. This parcel here is in the B1 zone, but the probability is they want to do it residentially, not not as a mixed use. I do, like the, I do like the mixed use idea. No, I understand. But I know that at least the person who owns that property would like to try to do it as residential only. In general, I like I like the mixed use idea. Yes. I lived for a number of years in Jamaica Plain, and they um, and they had like little supermarket in the middle of our neighborhood, and it was not tiny, but it was called Harvest and had 
organic foods and other foods. Or, I mean, it could it could be something that people would be able to work with you. You know, I think. I mean, it all depends on the town people want. I also really, I've sat on a number of 40B meetings. We don't have this type of report. We don't have this type of discussion we're having with you. So it's refreshing. Well, if you didn't go really in and come out of here. Some other? Yes. Just for a couple of uh, like visualizations for people. Um, if you visited the shops at the village at River's Edge, for example, which was probably built about five years ago in town under those current regulations, there are seven storefronts on the bottom, a market, organic buzz, a yoga studio, and there are five or six tenants upstairs, attorney Steve McDonough, um, you know, a, a financial planner, a dentist. So that building was built with the parking requirements that we have. And if you go by there any time during the day, there are 20 to 30 parking spaces unoccupied all day long. Uh, and with regard to the new building that Tom DePlacido built on the corner of Liberty and Union Street to house the Norfolk Credit Union, that has three uh, tenants on the first floor. The second floor are four one-bedroom apartments, and the third floor are two two-bedroom apartments. And we leased the four one-bedroom apartments with one parking space each in 30 days. All four. Right. Yes, ma'am. In, in regards to the parking, has anyone done a study of how many vehicles each unit at Boyd's Crossing has? Or the units up on the hill behind town hall there? Boyd's I'm just yeah. curious if they, you know, how many units at Boyd's vehicles Crossing have two are coming into town for that? I don't know of a study that has looked at that. Per unit. Some are under the buildings and some are detached. So there are two spaces to park. But do they, have, do they have two vehicles? Are they using them? That's right. what I'm curious about. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Someone was put one car in the family. Yeah, sure. Not a single one of them has a half a car. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Rich, I'd just like to clarify the inclusionary zoning. I don't believe that kicks in until there's 10 or more units. Yes. And, and for example, at the um, new 18 Union Street where the bank is, there's only eight apartments. There's actually eight apartments and there's four commercial tenants. Uh, so at eight there's apartments, apartments I've been in every one of them. Yeah, you the, think? Six. yeah the affordable six. housing is it, 10, it, 10 units. There's eight home. apartments there. There's four two bedrooms and four one bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there's only eight, there's nothing inclusionary there. So the inclusionary doesn't kick in until there's 10. And when there's 10, you're only required to have one. And when it's 40B, um, there's a 25% inclusionary requirement. So if there's 40 units, 10 of those are required to be affordable. And that's what we see at um, Boyd's Crossing. And when you go into apartments like they're trying to do at 194 Main Street under 40B, there's 70 apartments. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure if maybe 16 are required to be affordable, but 10% of 70. And when you have a 40B project that's all apartments, every one of those counts towards your quota. So that's just some clarification on the 40B. And then just one more comment on the 51% commercial for the downtown. I'm just not in favor of that. I think the whole first floor should be commercial. I don't know why we're putting residential on the first floor. We're looking for commercial downtown. And I think we should stick with all commercial on the first floor and to give that advantage to the developers so they don't have to put in an elevator, I think was the comment. I don't agree with that. I don't think it will be um, attractive to people who want to rent there. They're going to have to walk up four flights of stairs to get to an apartment if there's no elevator in a building like that. So I've just, um, I hope that you guys could relook at that and make it all commercial on the first floor. Thank you. So I just want to clarify.
verify what I'm hearing. We can choose what we do with downtown. We can decide what we want our downtown to be, or we can let the developers and do whatever they want with it, and we won't have any any say at all. I mean, that seems to me what the, the choice is. That's not what they're saying fully. They're saying they're trying to compete. 40 B still could come in. Yep. This is an option to try to make people think it's attractive. And, we, and that's, that's our only hope, and I think we give it a try, because otherwise we may look at what they just did right. as wall You're right. I, I think we can, I think I can express with relative certainty that the zoning you have today is prohibitive to development. Right. I, I think so, that will but, but I think, but I think where the, un, a little more, a little less certainty comes in is whether the zoning package of recommendations that we put forward is enough to f shift the scales so that you won't get 40B proposals and you would get proposals based upon this. I think that there is still um, a, a chance that even if these zoning recommendations were to pass and get approved, that you might still see a 40B project occur in downtown, a new one. Um, so it's, that's where there's less certainty there. It, to do, to, you could go farther as a community in terms of allowable scale and, and uses um, than what we have. Uh, so one example would be a four-story height instead of a three-and-a-half-story height. But uh, from what we were hearing in previous meetings, that seemed a little too high for what the comfort level of the community is. Um, but that, that might be another, that's a, the more, the more allowed density and scale you have, the better chances you have of avoiding the less controlled 40B. We'll go to the design guidelines. Yeah. So in addition to, just to wrap up the package of work that we're doing, and so you all know about it, we focused on the zoning recommendations because they do require that town meeting approval. We're also working through with the working committee uh, and the planning board and the design review board, a draft uh, design guideline document, which will be a companion to these zoning recommendations uh, and a supplement to it as well. And so that, that is both illustrated through diagrams, language, and photographs, what we think is are the important elements of design to occur in a project in town center. Uh, and so this document, which will also be available for public review soon, uh, it does not require town meeting approval, so that's why we've been a little less focused on it this evening. Uh, but we think it's an important aspect of this package so that you're not just, we're not just allowing this larger scale and a little bit more density, but we're actually using through these guidelines uh, encouraging refinement of the design in such a way that we think it would be more consistent with Norfolk Town Center. Some of examples of what that means uh, is looking at bays of the facade which comply with about a 40 foot distance, which is we've measured some of the buildings, many of the buildings downtown or in the town center and found that that's the scale that the buildings are occurring at. So you might have a bigger building, but you'll see it uh, hopefully through the design articulated uh, with sort of pushing and pulling in the plan that would allow it to read as a little bit more compact and modest structure. There would be a defined base, middle, and top of the building, which is what many of the buildings that are already existing have. There would be gable ends which face toward the street. So these are all very specific design guidance that would be a package that the design review board, the planning board would review to look at proposals to understand whether or not they're uh, adding to the character of the town center. And it would also be a, a, a document which a developer and his team of designers, architects, landscape architects would take a look at and bring forward a project to the town which would be in compliance with these guidelines. So it's a, a, a way to bring both to that uh, center point. And also talking about the windows, the roof features, how a building sits on a site, the landscaping of the site, all of that would be a part of uh, what we're talking about in this document. And then, additionally, we've touched on many of the topics here tonight, but we are doing some uh, work as well through this study 
thinking about current Board of Health regulations, how that relates to wastewater considerations. The current regulations are more restrictive than the Title V regulations of the state, so we're thinking about that with our uh, Director of Environment at MAPC, Martin Pillsbury. Uh, and then th we've also, throughout this process, heard a lot of comments and feedback about which streets should be more walkable or bikeable to get a larger area of people who are connected to town center and helping to make it a vibrant place. There's stormwater considerations as well, and then other utilities. We've heard about water this evening. There's also gas connections, electric connections, and making sure that all of those are considered. We're not doing full technical studies on these aspects, but we're, we're trying to think through them from a planning perspective to make sure that mixed use development has all the different components that are necessary. And just maybe kind of a, a few closing comments, and then maybe if there were maybe a few more hands, we could take some more questions to wrap it up. But this is, uh, we've touched on this a lot, the potential for adding new investments that are consistent with the town center and that vision. Um, adding new uses, activity, and destinations that are in currently vacant properties, that has a, uh, both an economic development effect in terms of uh, the uses in the town center, the ability to provide jobs, tax revenues, uh, but it also uh, changes the real estate economics of those properties in town center and allows more properties to invest in themselves over time. Uh, and uh, it may not be the housing choice you want to see in this audience, but there are residents in Norfolk who are looking for other ways to live, maybe looking for places to downsize, places to live without a, as dependence on a car. Uh, and we're trying to look at new ways that Norfolk can provide those opportunities in the town without having to have people move to another community. So these are all, uh, I think, benefits of what we're talking about in these recommendations. Uh, and they're opportunities that don't necessarily exist today in the same way. So with that, we'll answer, open up to questions again, but thank you all for taking the time to come out with us this evening. Appreciate you coming out tonight. We know how valuable your time is, and your input is very important.